Hello everyone. Thank you for taking your time today to join us for this webinar on AWS Genomics Workflow Automation Solutions. My name is Lee Pang and I'm a Principal Bioinformatics Architect with our Health AI Services team and lead the development of services and products focused on the interaction of health, life sciences, and AI and ML. I'm also joined today by my colleague, Ryan. Hello, my name is Ryan Ulasic. I'm the worldwide tech lead for genomics at AWS. I oversee techni technical initiatives in genomics and work with my many life science customers, helping them architect the right genomic solutions in the cloud. Today, we'll talk about the challenges in, in genomics and how AWS can help address those challenges. We'll cover examples for how customers use AWS for running genomics workflows and provide additional resources. But before we start, I think it's important to understand what the challenges are in genomics when it comes to data analysis. This chart shows how much it costs to generate a whole human genome from 2001 to 2019. What started as something mirroring Moore's law has rapidly accelerated to the point where the cost of sequencing is at or below $1,000, making it more widely accessible. Globally, over $4 billion has been appropriated to the population sequencing initiatives to better understand genetic risk factors and contribute to population health. Over 60 million individuals are expected to have their genome sequenced in the healthcare setting by 2025. What this means is that the amount of genomics data generated each year outpaces the volume of data generated from other fields traditionally thought of as large, such as astronomy, social media, or video content. Now, genomics workloads come with some key considerations. First, genomics data sets can be rather large. Currently, files that store a single whole genome can be hundreds of gigabytes in size as sequencing technology improves, more data can be extracted from biological samples, further increasing the size of raw data files. Also, as genome sequencing becomes easier to do, it will be applied more broadly. For instance, there are a number of national initiatives to sequence whole populations. Combined, these generate immense data gravity. Genomics data sets have become too big to download to your local compute infrastructure for analysis. Second, there are a lot of computational steps involved with processing raw genomics data into something that's scientifically or clinically actionable. These tools range from simple QC metrics and statistics on raw data to application of machine learning algorithms to identify significant genetic variants in a population. The variety of tools involved means that there are also a variety of computational needs. For genomics processing analysis workloads to operate efficiently, computational infrastructure needs to be both scalable and flexible. So how can the cloud help? To level set, let's briefly talk about what the cloud is and how it can help with genomics. AWS provides four foundational sets of services that are relevant to genomics workflows. First is compute via Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 which provides cloud-based virtual machines. Storage via Amazon Elastic Block Store or simple storage service, providing things like cloud-based drives or buckets to store objects of data. And identity and security via services like AWS Identity and Access Management. These foundational services allow AWS to provide higher level services like AWS Batch, Amazon Elastic Container Service, and AWS Step Functions which we'll describe in more detail later. An important point is the cloud is globally distributed. AWS has a presence in 25 geographically isolated regions, and each region is comprised of multiple availability zones, which are distinct but closely coupled data centers with a total of 81 availability zones. And this footprint is constantly increasing at a significant rate. So what does the cloud provide? First, it provide, provides security. AWS core infrastructure is custom built and designed to meet the most stringent security requirements in the world. For availability, cloud infrastructure and services are designed for high availability. 
Applications can be spread across multiple AZs or multiple regions. When talking about performance, AWS offers low latency, low packet loss, high overall network quality, and a wide variety of instance types to optimize the compute jobs in your workflow for performance. Cloud applications can run dynamically and scale to meet immediate demand. Run, you can run your applications how and where you need them. And finally, all of this is provided at a low cost to customers. AWS provides you with computing services like your local utilities would provide you with power or water services. With AWS, computing infrastructure is available on demand and fit to your immediate needs. You only need to pay as you go. There are no upfront contracts to get started and you only pay for what you use. The burden of procuring and managing hardware is lifted, allowing you to focus on your application and business needs. Genomics data is considered very personal and the protection of that data is critical. The combination of ISO, SOC, and HIPAA is often used for service approval by customers and regulators and indicates that AWS has its side of the shared responsibility model covered. AWS provides customers with a number of resources to cover their side of the shared responsibility model and secure their applications. For example, for GXP, there is a compliance pack for 21 CFR part 11 for both AWS Config and AWS Audit Manager. We also provide security guidance in the form of white papers, blog posts, reference architectures, and solutions. We have a wide variety of genomics customers currently using AWS. These customers range from government to enterprise to startup. We work with partners like Seven Bridges, DNA Nexus, LifeBit, and PopSeq initiatives such as Genomics England, with research institutes such as the Fred Hutch, and with farmers like Moderna, Roche, AstraZeneca, and instrument providers like Illumina and Oxford Nanopore, and many others. And we support our genomics customers through the entire genomics data journey, from data produced by genomic sequencers through transfer to the cloud, data analysis, interpretation, and clinical application of that data. Today, we'll focus in on one of these solution areas, workflow automation and secondary analysis. And with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Lee. Thank you. So before we dive into solutions, I want to level set a bit and talk about what genomics workflows are. At a high level, they convert raw sequence data into a format that is ready for science and interpretation. These workflows boil down to a sequence of tools that convert the data in their own special way. Each step of the process takes files as inputs and generates files as outputs, which are used as inputs for downstream steps. Each tool in the workflow is unique. Some can be command line utilities, others Python scripts, and others still could be Java or C++ programs. As a result, each tool has specific computational needs and performance profiles. Some may be compute bound while others need lots of memory. Also, parts of the pipeline may run quickly and others more slowly. This adds complexity to how and when a tool in the workflow should run. When it comes to building and running genomics workflow pipelines, there are three major infrastructure components you should consider. Workflow orchestration, job execution, and storage. And AWS services like AWS Step Functions, AWS Batch, and Amazon S3 can help you build scalable architectures to meet these needs. So with that in mind, let's take a look at how this comes together and the solutions you can use today. Working with our customers and partners, we established this reference architecture. It uses AWS Step Functions as a workflow orchestrator, AWS Batch to run containerized jobs on just the right amount of compute needed, and Amazon S3 for durable, highly available, and secure storage. What's important to note here is that this architecture is entirely serverless. This means that compute scales up as needed when running workflows and compute completely scales down when workflows complete. There are no permanently running servers to manage. For customers with the resources to build on their own, 
You can build on top of this architecture, customizing it to meet your specific needs. A reference architecture is available as open source code in the form of CloudFormation templates. These templates make defining and deploying cloud architectures easy and reproducible. You can substitute third-party open source workflow orchestration engines like Cromwell, Airflow, or Nextflow. This lets you run pre-existing workflows in popular definition languages like WDL, CWL, or Nextflow. Your workflows can pull containerized tooling from public image registries like key.io or Docker Hub. And your results can be saved to shared file systems in Amazon EFS or Amazon FSx for Lustre. For those of you that are new to AWS or need something more turnkey, we've recently released the Amazon Genomics CLI. Amazon Genomics CLI, or AGC for short, is an open source and open standards based command line tool that helps you run genomics workflows by automating the deployment of resources you need like workflow engines and compute clusters. AGC is a simple tool that can run in any Nix-like terminal and creates resources in your AWS account. Using AGC, which is also the name of the command line you use in the terminal, you can have a genomics workflow running in just a few commands. So what does AGC like to use? First, you set up your environment by activating your account to deploy core infrastructure that AGC uses. Next, you create a project and define the workflows and data you want to use. Then you deploy an AGC context, which will launch workflow engines and compute res resources needed. Finally, you run your workflow. That's it. Finally, for those of you that need a solution with rich domain-specific features, we recommend using AWS partner offerings. For workflow automation, many of our customers use offerings like Illumina Dragon, DNA Nexus, Titan, and Apollo, Seven Bridges, Graph, Aria, and Rio, NVIDIA Parabricks, Sakara Labs Nextflow Pro and Nextflow Tower, Paradigm 4 Reveal and SciDB, Databricks Unified and Al Analytics Platform for Genomics, LifeBit AI Engine, and CloudOS, and Kyogen's CLC Genomics. The AWS Partner Network has tens of thousands of APN partners from all across the globe, and our partners cover a wide spectrum of needs from sequencing instruments to accelerated tooling to collaborative research workspaces and multimodal analysis. Many of our partner offerings are easily accessible in the AWS Marketplace, which allows you to combine partner offerings, application license management, and AWS services in one bundle with fully transparent pricing for the duration of use. For example, you can quickly launch accelerated genomics analysis tooling and workflows, such as NVIDIA Parabricks, the Sentient Genomics Suite, and Illumina Dragon, all from the AWS Marketplace. Now let's take a few moments to look at some demos like using native AWS solutions for secondary analysis, working with the Amazon Genomics CLI and a solution from an AWS partner. Let's take a hands-on look at running the Amazon Genomics CLI. To do this, I've prepared a pre-recorded demo as some actions take a bit of time to complete. Here I am in my system terminal. Amazon Genomics CLI, or AGC for short, will run on any Nix-based terminal. This includes Mac OS, Linux distributions like Ubuntu or Amazon Linux, and under the Windows system, subsystem for Linux. I've just finished installing AGC and adding it to my local path. When I call AGC by itself, I'll get the top level help, which describes some of the major functionalities of AGC. This includes setting up your account, setting up projects, launching contexts, running workflows, and retrieving logs. The first thing you'll want to do is configure AGC with your email address. For this demo, I'm going to use user at domain.com. AGC uses this as your user ID and will tag all of the resources you create with it. This will also help you 
to track all of the resources and costs associated with running workflows via AGC. Now you need to activate your account. This takes a few minutes, so I'll speed things up a little bit. During this step, AGC is creating core resources that it used to operate. By default, this will create a new VPC and S3 bucket, but you can bring your own if you want to reuse resources you already have. Okay, now that the activation is complete, let's create a test project. Uh, first, I'll create a folder. Change directory into it. And then run agc project init with the project name of test. This will create an agc project config file. If we look into the, inside this file, you can see the project name, the config schema version, and one context already configured. This config is simple and we'll use AGC defaults, which is running Whittle based, Whittle based workflows using on-demand instances. For a better picture of what you can configure, let's look at a fully defined example. AGC installs a couple of example projects to help you get started. Let's take a look at the demo project and its config file. Here, you can see we have workflows, data sources, and a context configured. The workflows here are a couple of simple ones like a hello world one, and one that is more complex based on a common genomics analysis step called the haplotype caller. The data sources configured here point to publicly available buckets from the AWS registry of open data. You can also add sources that are private as long as you have access to them. The context is configured to run Whittle-based workflows using the Cromwell engine, and workflow jobs will run using on-demand instances. You, context can also run on spot instances. Let's add one to this project that does. We'll call it my spot context. The only difference here is that we need to add a request spot instances property and set it to true. Dropping back out to the terminal, let's launch one of the contexts with AGC context deploy. What this is doing is creating all the resources needed to run Whittle workflows, such as a Cromwell service and corresponding AWS batch compute resources. Now that the context is deployed, we can run workflows. We can list the workflows we have available in the project with AGC workflow list. Let's run the hello workflow. To do this, we'll use AGC workflow run, the name of the workflow, and the context we want to run the workflow in. In this case, my context. You can have multiple AGC contexts running at the same time, each with different configurations. After hitting enter, you'll get a unique identifier for the workflow execution instance. You can check the state of a workflow with AGC workflow status. Here we see that the hello workflow has started to run. This is a pretty quick workflow. And if we wait a little bit, 
and check again later, it should show that it has completed. To check out what the workflow did, you can retrieve its logs. You can do this with the agc logs workflow command. Let's do that for the hello workflow we just ran. Here we see that this workflow printed hello Amazon Genomics CLI. For a more complex workflow, we'd see output from all the tasks printed out. This is helpful while you develop workflows and need to debug individual steps. When you're done running workflows, you can turn off context you are no longer using to save costs. To do this, you simply run agc context destroy and the name of the context. This will terminate all compute resources used to run workflows like workflow engines and associated AWS batch resources. And that's about all it takes to run workflows with the Amazon Genomics CLI. Hello, the demo today will be for the genomic secondary analysis using AWS Step Functions and AWS Batch solution. You can find the solution on the Genomic Solution homepage. The Genomic Solution homepage describes purpose-built solutions from AWS and AWS partners that span from data transfer from genomic sequencers through analysis and interpretation and into biological and clinical insight. This page describes different solution areas, one of which is secondary analysis. So if we scroll down to that solution area, click on secondary analysis, drill into workflow automation, we'll find our solution link. Clicking on the link takes us to the solution homepage. This solution creates a scalable environment in your AWS account to develop, build, deploy, and run genomic secondary analysis workflows. And the solution comes with continuous integration and continuous in delivery built in CI CD, which makes it easy to get end to end quickly in your account. An operational dashboard in AWS CloudWatch is also provided so you can monitor status and performance for your workflows. The solution also comes with an implementation guide. If you click on view implementation guide, the implementation guide will walk you through how to install the solution, how it works, and the architecture. Let's start with the architecture, talk about the components, and then we'll go into the demo. When you click on the launch stack URL to launch the CloudFormation stack for the solution, it will launch a setup stack, which will create a code build job, which will run a setup script. The setup script will launch a landing zone stack, which creates a code commit repository, a CloudWatch event, and a code pipeline deployment pipeline. When the stack is set up successfully for the landing zone stack, the setup script will push code into this code repository, triggering the CloudWatch event, triggering the deployment pipeline to run, which deploys the deployment pipeline stack. The deployment pipeline stack will create a code commit repository, CloudWatch event, and code pipeline. When this deployment stack setup is complete, the setup script will push code into this code repository, which triggers the CloudWatch event, which triggers the deployment pipeline to run, deploying the code base stack. The code base stack will deploy step functions, state machine, or workflow for your example for secondary analysis, an AWS batch compute environment to run jobs in your workflows, buckets in S3 to store the data, Amazon ECR container repositories to store the containerized bioinformatics tools, and an operational dashboard in Amazon CloudWatch. If you want to make changes to the deployment pipeline, for example, add bi other bioinformatics tools to be built and deployed to ECR, you can commit your code changes to this repo, which will trigger this deployment pipeline to deploy your changes. If you want to make changes to any of these architecture components, like add a step functions workflow, you can commit your code changes to this repository, which will then be deployed through this pipeline in the stack to, to in this example, step functions. All right, so we've gone through how the architecture works. Now let's set up the solution in the account and go through the demo. Let's go back to the secondary analysis homepage. Let's go to the launch and AWS console button. 
This takes you to CloudFormation in your AWS account. You have to be logged in to your AWS account for this to work. All of the faults are already set and the URL is already in place, so you don't have to type it in for the CloudFormation template you need to run. You simply connect, click Next. Enter a stack name. Secondary Analysis Demo will be our name. You also have two parameters here. The project parameter provides a token that will be a prefix for all the resources that are, named, that are created in your account. This allows you to install solutions side by side specifying unique prefixes so you don't have any resource collisions. There's also a smoke test option to run the smoke tests after the solution is set up to check everything. We could just leave these as default and go to next. If you configure and configure stack options, leave everything default, click next, and then in review, check the checkbox at the bottom. bottom. In the interest of time, I won't create the stack because it takes about 20 minutes to set up the solution. So I'll cancel, which will take me to the CloudFormation page where you can see the solution is set up in the account. At the bottom, you see the setup stack that we talked about in the architecture, the zone stack that deploys the deployment pipeline for the other deployment pipeline, the workflow pipe deployment pipeline that's broken out into nested stacks, so we've broken out to roles, the code build jobs for each containerized tool. Then the solution stack, which deploys networking roles, batch, and a workflow definition and an operational dashboard as nested stacks. Let's go look at the deployment pipeline so you can see how the solution components are deployed. When you make a change to the code repo for the solution, the first thing that runs is a build stage. A code action deploys some of the nested CloudFormation templates that you need to run in the next stage. And then there are three actions that run that build, package, and deploy the bioinformatics tools to ECR. So let's drill into BWA to see how that works. What code build does is it runs the Docker run command or Docker build command on the Docker file to pull the image dependencies install the packages and push the image that's built to ECR. If the image repository in ECR is, is not there, it will be created for you. Let's go to ECR and you can see here, there's three repositories and in the BWA repository, there's the image that was built in that code build job. Okay, now let's go back to our code build job and deployment pipeline. Once this stage is complete, complete and all of our containerized tools are deployed to ECR, the create stack stage runs, deploying the solution to CloudFormation with CloudFormation. And that deploys these last, the stack and all these nested stacks that we talked about before. Okay, so now we've talked about how the solution is deployed. Let's actually run some workflows. To do that, we want to start here in the CloudFormation console, click on Workflow Simple, and first grab an output parameter, which is our input to our test workflow in Step Functions. We do this because we generate some unique paths to buckets in S3, which will be different for each user. So copy this to your clipboard. You go to the Step Functions console, find the workflow that you want to run. In our case, it's Workflow Simple. You'll notice that a bunch of workflows have already been run successfully. So let's start execution and paste in the input that we have from the other, from the CloudFormation console. And run. What you notice here is the execution input first. In the input, you have a queue. The queue is an Amazon resource name for the job queue in ABS batch. Step functions will submit all the jobs for the workflow to this queue. Then you have environment variables. Reference name is the first environment variable. The reference is the uh, human genome HD38 reference in this case. The wrapper script that's built into each tool will take this name and construct an S3 path to where we store the reference files. Sample ID is the sample we want to run. 
source data prefix is the location where the samples are stored in S3. The job output prefix is where the job results will be in S3. And the job's AWS CLI path is where the binaries can be found in each container. You can also specify the chromosomes that you want to run in the sample to do the analysis. In the middle of the screen, you have the graph inspector that has a visual representation of the workflow. Green indicates that the task is completed successfully. Red would indicate failed. Blue indicates that it's running. White indicates it has not run yet. These boxes indicate that an iterator is being used in ASL, Amazon States language, to run these tasks in parallel. In, in the interest of time, I won't go into ASL or the workflow definition. You can learn more about ASL in the step function documentation and this particular workflow in the code in the solution. At the bottom of the screen, you have an event execution history, which are all the tasks that have been executed up to this moment. Now let's go over to the AWS Batch Console to see how things are running. Let's start with the dashboard. You can see we have one job running, 130 succeeded, and three have failed. In the jobs queue overview, you see the queues that we've provisioned for the solution. The low priority queue, for example, has one job running. In the computer environment overview, you see the two computer environments we have set up. The on-demand computer environment is using a provisioning model of EC2 for on-demand instances, and the spot environment is using spot as a provisioning model to provision spot instances. You can specify instance types, particular instance types, in your computer environment, or you can just allow batch to pick those for you based on the requirements of the jobs, in this case, by specifying optimal. Also thing to note is the desired number of CPUs or virtual CPUs. When jobs are submitted to a batch queue, batch will determine the number of virtual CPUs that are needed, increase this desired CPU number. When that's increased, batch will then provision instances in the compute environment to run those jobs. When the jobs are complete and there's no more queue jobs in the queue, the instances will be deprovisioned. In this way, you can scale up and down on demand and only pay for the resources that you use. If you click on the jobs item on the left, you can drill into job specific details for the jobs that are running or have run already in batch. Let's drill into BWA mem, one that's completed. You can see the details for this job, things like the job queue that the job was submitted to, its status succeeded, and log stream name. If you click on the log stream name, this will take you to the log stream or standard out for the tool. This can be really useful if you need to debug failures in your jobs. You'll notice we're writing out uh, inputs to the jobs and the environment variables. We're also writing out to standard out things that are downloaded, the command and the parameters, and then the upload back to S3. Now let's go back to, let's go to job definitions. In job definitions, you can see the details of each job definition. Job definitions allow you to define things like the image location in ECR, where the tools can be found, the number of CPUs and memory that are needed. Job definitions provide the details that Batch needs to know how to run jobs in AWS Batch. Clicking on jobs queues allows you to drill into the details for job queues. You'll see here that the job queue is associated with compute environments. If there are no instances available in the first environment, Batch will move on to the next one. For compute environments, you can drill in and see the details for each compute environment, things like minimum CPU desired or maximum number of CPUs. Now let's look at our workflow to see how it's run. And it looks like it's almost complete. It's succeeded in running all these tasks. Now it's running things in parallel. Let's go take a look at uh, the output in S3. So you can go to uh, the jobs result bucket and look for this workflow. And then this particular job execution or step functions execution ID in that location. Starts with 2E8. So we'll go to our jobs results bucket, click on the workflow, and then we look for 238 or 2E8.
drill into there and you can see the files that have written there so far. If this was completed, you'd see the VCFs as well. Now let's go take a look at the CloudWatch operational dashboard. Refresh. So you can see in the last three hours, or in the last month, 13 workflows have completed. None have failed, none have timed out. You can see here a data point for the workflow status, which is succeeded. You can also see the overall performance, the runtime of your overall workflows and the count as a graph. And this concludes the demo uh, for the secondary analysis solution. Thank you. And finally, let's take a look at a solution from AWS partner, DNA Nexus. Hello, I'm John Penn. I'm a Solution Science Director at DNA Nexus, and I'm here today to talk to you about how DNA Nexus empowers informaticists and scientists in automation with cloud compute resources, particularly around omics. Now, DNA Nexus is the industry-leading uh, omics software platform, both in security and in functionality. And so quickly, let me just jump in and, and show you what it looks like. The first thing we're seeing here is actually a visual representation of what a workflow looks like on our platform. Our, our pipelines can be constructed of both apps, which are existing tools available to all users across all organizations on our platform, and applets, which users can design and bring uh, their own proprietary software to the platform, wrapping it either in uh, native DNA Nexus applets, uh, bringing Whittle and Docker or CWL and Docker pipelines, or operating uh, specifically with Docker to bring their own tools into this pipeline, which they can then add in a drag and drop fashion at launch. Now, here you can see I can actually populate uh, any required fields using a kind of drag and drop or point and click methodology and launch with a, a button click. And while there are options for uh, bulk analysis through workflows through the UI. In terms of automation, we find that's not necessarily the best way to go. So we do also provide our well two methodologies. One, our DX toolkit, which is a number of bindings that work through our API, but using a DX preface, I can use a number of bash commands that will set me, as you'll see, directly into a DNX, DNA Nexus project. This is also the, the manner in which I can uh, upload once I uh, correctly wrapped into a native functional application, uh, any of my own proprietary or personal code and use that in any of my workflows. For that kind of development, uh, you can do that either in the command line or we also provide Jupyter Lab notebooks. So here's an example of actually a Jupyter Lab notebook that we use to upload and test a particular Surat analysis but then took this particular Surat analysis and essentially copied and pasted code directly out of this as it worked, directly into an application that we were running, excuse me, uh, that allows us to, to automate this and add this into any particular workflow. Again, this is a, a, an application. This was the source code for it. But that actual applet then becomes a, a very a clickable and easily runnable application which again can either be launched from the UI with a push button from the command line or now added into any additional workflows. Our rich REST API, as long with our DX toolkit, allows users to automate all aspects of their production pipeline from launching to monitoring, to terminating, to evaluating resources. Since all applications have the option to modify the app, the the compute resources associated with it, the inputs and the like, users have a great deal of flexibility, one, one about how they launch existing applications. Users have a tremendous amount of flexibility with the platform, with both existing tools, tools that they can bring, to the, bring themselves to the platform, and the ability to stitch all of those tools together, either in a drag and drop fashion through the UI, or utilizing command line tools as appropriate. The beauty of the workflow as it, it is, exists on, on the platform is that once a workflow has been wrapped, you can launch one to n number of samples. And the scaling and security required for the underlying compute is all handled abstractly by the platform. So a user really just gets to hit the easy button. One of the examples I like to use of this is for six years while I, I worked at the Regeneron Genetic Center, I very proudly said that I have created a pipeline that scaled from a couple hundred samples a week to more than 15,000 whole exomes a week without a single line of code change. 
And what I now more happily admit over the last year is that really all I did was wrap a single pipeline and push go as many times as I needed to. Um, DNA Nexus loves helping with the automation and science. So beyond even the automation of workflows, DNA Nexus also does provide scientific collaboration for users in the development of tools and workflows and evaluating the best ways to use them. So if you have any questions, we are always happy to answer. So please feel free to reach out to us if, if anything arises. Those are some fantastic demos. Thank you very much for, uh, for doing that. So how are some customers using solutions like these? Bayer Crop Science wanted to reduce costs and increase the modularity of genomic data analysis inter and interpretation. Working with AWS Professional Services, they built a modular gen genomics analysis pipeline using native services like AWS Step Functions. As a result, they were able to lower costs and turnaround times for their analysis. And they lowered barriers to entry with genomics analysis for their users. Here, researchers at Fred Hutch wanted to, computate, to do computationally intensive analysis of microbiome genomic data to develop health insights. To do this, they used NextFlow running on AWS Batch to scale out their computing needs. And as a result, they were able to process 15,000 samples each about a gigabyte in size in just seven days, a task that would have otherwise taken seven years. And finally, Genomics England, or GEL, wanted to leverage data from 35,000 COVID-19 patients and 100,000 historical cohort participants to help with COVID-19 research. GEL partnered with LifeBit, an AWS partner whose end-to-end -end platform, data platform allows researchers across the globe to query, analyze, augment, and collaborate on large data sets. And as a result, GEL was able to create the most cutting edge population uh, research environment capable of analyzing data from over 1 million ind individuals. So with that, let's recap. If there's anything to take away from today, it's that AWS enables scalable genomics workloads in the following ways. You can build scalable and secure architectures that reduce costs and improve turnaround time for genomic analysis. Cloud resources are defined and deployed with code, minimizing your operational overhead. You have the flexibility to use the solution that fits your needs the best, be it starting with, starting with and customizing reference architectures, using the Amazon Genomics CLI to help you quickly get started, or leveraging one or more AWS partner offerings. Together, this allows you to accelerate experimentation and achieve your business and research outcomes faster. Okay, so there certainly was a lot of information we presented today, and there's much more that we couldn't fit into this session. But if you want to learn more, we have many resources available to you on the links on this slide. Also, please visit our AWS Health homepage and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. And if you'd like to stay up to date with the most recent events and news related to AWS for Health and Genomics, I highly recommend subscribing to our newsletter. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time with us today. Stay safe, stay healthy.